Hello, welcome to the Math 135 video, A Poor Choice of Independent Variable. The intensity of this video is spicy. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objective for this video is, by the end of this video, you should be able to compare different choices of independent variables in optimization problems. Our motivation for this video comes from a previous video. In a previous video by another instructor, they solved the following optimization problem. They found the maximum area of a trapezoid inscribed inside of a semicircle of a fixed radius where the base of the trapezoid was the diameter of the semicircle. So they solved this problem using angles, and our motivation is that we're going to solve it in a different, worse way. So how can we do that? Well, this isn't our real motivation. We don't just want to do something worse because we can. Our actual motivation is we want to know how do we choose an independent variable in optimization problems. We're going to do ours in a worse way, um, and then we'll compare and see why is it that ours was worse, and why would we think to use um, a method like in Dr. De Jong's video. So let's start off with the problem. Find the maximum area of a trapezoid inscribed inside of a semicircle of radius r, where the base of the trapezoid is the diameter of the semicircle. This problem looks something like this. We want to find the area of this trapezoid. Now, the previous video solved this problem by thinking about the trapezoid as three triangles and thinking about this angle that's made with the center and one of the vertices of the trapezoid. You can see that as your angle gets thinner, the height of the trapezoid will go down, and so you'll have a really short trapezoid. If your angle is really open, then you might get something that's closer to a triangle. And you can see that you can run through all of the possible trapezoids in this way by changing the angle. So here the theta was our independent variable. If you want to see how Dr. De Jong solved this problem, you can watch her video. Our next question is, what other independent variables can we use to solve this problem? I think the most natural thing that controls the trapezoid is the height. You can imagine that the height starts at nothing, and then you'll have a really thin trapezoid, and as you open up the height, you'll get larger and larger trapezoids until you have it all the way at the top and you have a triangle. That's one possible independent variable we can use. Another one would be the part of the top here, the length of the top. So I'm going to illustrate this using a variable called x. So it's the length from the center to this vertex. Now you can use this as your independent variable, and if your x is very thin, you'll have the triangle, and if your x is very wide, then your trapezoid will be very short. So these will both work. For our purposes, we're going to use h, which is the height of the trapezoid, to solve our problem. And as a warning, it's going to get messy, there's going to be a lot of algebra, but there won't be anything sophisticated. It'll mostly just be grinding. Okay, let's get to it. Our first question is, what is the area of the trapezoid in terms of h, r, and x? So in the previous video, the trapezoid was divided into three triangles, and we added up the area of those triangles. For this one, we need to find the area of the trapezoid. I don't think I've ever learned a formula for the area of a trapezoid, so but I do know the areas of rectangles and triangles. So let's think of this uh, of this trapezoid as a rectangle here, a rectangle here, and then the two triangles on the end. So that will be the area of our trapezoid. Now, do we know the area of this rectangle? Yeah, it's x times h. And now, do we know the area of this triangle? Well, the height is h. And what's this length right here? Well, the length from the center is r, and we've removed x. So this is r minus x right here. So there we go. It's base times height over 2. And then the rectangle was xh. Expanding this out, so we multiply through the two, we combine the xh terms, and then we eventually get something like this. So now we have a formula for the area of the trapezoid using h, x, and r only. Now, is this the type of thing we're going to optimize? 
Well, here r is a constant. It's fixed in the problem. It's not changing. But the h and the x are both changing. So it seems like we have two variables. In order to get rid of one of those variables, we need to write x in terms of h and then substitute one of them. So how do x and h relate to each other? That's our next goal. Well, if you go out x amount here and go up h, you get to the circle. That tells you that x and h are related by the circle formula. So x squared plus h squared is r squared. Now solving for x gives us x is the square root of r squared minus h squared. And now we can substitute this back into the area formula we just found to have a formula just with h's. So starting with our area formula, let's get rid of that x. So we've plugged in this value of x. And then it'll be handy for us to expand it out, so we'll write it like this. So the thing that's important for us is that we've written our area formula just in terms of h's and r's. h is our variable and r is a constant that's not changing. So this is the function we're going to optimize. Before we do the optimization, let's think about what the bounds are on h. So what's the smallest h could be in this problem and what's the largest h could be? The smallest is zero, so the height can't go below zero. And what's the largest h we can pick? Well, if we go all the way up to the top here, that would be a length from the center to the edge of the circle. That would be the radius r. Okay, so now let's write everything that we need to do. Our goal is to optimize the function a of h, which is this thing, on the interval from zero to r. We've gotten rid of all of the geometry in the problem, and now we just have to do some annoying and tedious algebra, but it's just algebra. So as an exercise, try this first. Find the derivative of a of h and find where this derivative is zero. So take a moment, pause the video and do that now. All right, let's do this. So our first step is to find the derivative of a of h. Here, this h of r part is no problem. Um, and this part right here, we have to use the product rule on. So this h of r just becomes r. We use the product rule. Here's the secret derivative of h, which is just one. And then the derivative of the square root is one over two square root. And then we have to use the chain rule. Now we can't simplify this too much, but we can cancel the twos and we can combine the h's. So let's do that. There we go. We combine the h's and cancel the twos. Now our next goal is to find the critical points. So where is this equal to zero? And that does not look particularly fun, figuring out where this thing is equal to zero, but let's do it and see what happens. So here I've rewritten everything. Our goal is to figure out where is the derivative of zero? Where is this kind of messy thing with square roots equal to zero? Our goal is to find a formula of h in terms of r. So let's move over this minus h squared and try to get rid of the square root. That's actually going to be a lot of the work and what we're aiming for. So we moved our minus h squared over. There are a couple ways to get rid of the square root. You can square both sides or you can multiply by the denominator. I'm going to do that one. So when we multiply by the denominator, this r picks up a copy of the denominator. And here we have a square root times a square root, so it just becomes the thing itself. Here now to get rid of the square root, we will square both sides, but let's first move this stuff over here. Now we can square both sides. This is starting to look like a mess. Let's expand the r squared and hope everything works out. Okay, so we've multiplied through the r squared. Let's combine the r, well, the r4 terms cancel, and we have an r squared h squared and an r squared h squared, so let's combine them. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. So our goal is to figure out where is this zero, and we can factor out an h squared, so let's do that. Okay, when is this going to be zero? 
h could be 0, or this other term could be 0. Now for us, h will never be 0, um, because we're thinking about when do we have the maximum area. If h is 0, the area will be 0. So there's no point in thinking about this part. This other part, though, looks promising. So this looks like a critical point that we actually care about. So let's think about this one. Rewriting it on the next slide. Let's isolate h in terms of r. So we move the 3r squared over, and now we can solve for h in terms of r. So h is plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2 times r. OK, that looks pretty good. So now what do we need to do? Now we need to figure out, is the area actually maximized here? So that's our last little bit of dirty work. Let's use that critical point to find the area. So here's our area formula. Here's the critical point. So now we need to plug in this critical point into the area formula and make sure that it's a maximum. It would be very embarrassing if we accidentally found a minimum. So plugging in this h into this formula here gives us this thing with nested square roots. Let's deal with this square first. So this will become a 3. This will become an r squared. This becomes a 4. We also moved these r's together to become an r squared. Let's combine the middle part. This is like 4 r squared over 4. So we combine them. Now we have a square root, which looks uh, pretty good. We can apply it to the r squared and to the 4. Absorb those into this. So this should be an r squared. There's a square missing here. And then when we add these together, we get 3 times root 3 over 4 times r squared. Again, there should be a r squared here. And this is great. This is exactly the answer that was um, uh, achieved in the previous video. So we have uh, reason to believe that we did something right. Okay, um, I'm not going to finish the rest of this, uh, but this is basically it. The rest of it is contained in um, the previous video. But we're done it. We did all the hard work. So let's take a moment to reflect. What made the calculations in this solution so long? And a similar question, what made the calculations in Dr. Young's solution so short? Do either of the solutions require a clever idea? Did you have to be smart in order to solve either, uh, use either solution? Do either solution use any non-standard geometry formulas? Or are they all basic geometry? And it's the algebra that's tricky. And let's end with an exercise. Solve the same problem of maximizing the area of the trapezoid, but instead of using the angle theta here, or instead of using the height, Use this angle right here as your independent variable. Thank you very much and have a great day.